Great. So thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Ashley Namiro, and I'm with the MHPSS Collaborative. This webinar is actually the fourth and final webinar in our series of four webinars that we've been doing over the last year as part of our Child and Family Community of Practice, which is supported by HIAS, the MHPSS Collaborative, and MHPSS.net. I'm really excited today. We are here with incredible colleagues who are expert in the field of climate change and mental health and psychosocial support. And we're going to be discussing what are the key issues affecting children and families. We all know this is an incredibly important topic that is more and more you hear it coming up. It's it's something that is now part of, of rhetoric when we're talking about well-being, when we're talking about mental health, and when we're talking about issues affecting the world. And I just wanted to briefly give an overview of some UNICEF statistics that have recently come out, and then I will pass over to my colleagues. So we know that the compounding risks associated with climate change particularly in contexts of fragility, weak governance, and displacement, have led humanitarian protection actors to really term the climate crisis a, a human rights crisis. And amongst those at risk, the most at risk are children and adolescents who often make up such a large proportion of the population of people who are living in humanitarian settings and also displacement settings. We also know that young people in these settings are already subjected to significant number of chronic stressors, including exposure to, to physical violence, also malnutrition, lack of social support, etc. And these uh, risk factors just further um, really lead to the development of, of mental health conditions. So I'm very happy to be here today and talking about this intersectionality of climate change and mental health and well-being. And I want to introduce a, a dear colleague and friend, Viola Graf, who is an MHPSS and climate change consultant who is supporting the MHPSS Collaborative. She has a background in public health research, and she's an early stage researcher who's been working on climate change and mental health for the last few years. And my first question to Viola to set the stage here for us today is, Viola, considering the intersectionality of mental health and well-being for children and families, the intersectionality between mental health and well-being and climate change for children and families, what are the biggest issues from your perspective that we're seeing today? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and yes, yeah, so in terms of biggest issues, um, I think I just want to start by um, just clarifying also that when we talk about climate change, um, we're talking about not just changes in the weather as climate change, um, describes, but also the ecological changes as well. So changes in biodiversity loss and persistent habitat destruction, for example. Um, and so in terms of the challenges for children and families, one way to see that is to really look through the developmental lens. Um, as we know, mental health burden in children and adolescents is very high age of onset and um, is also exceptionally high in, in people under 25 in children and adolescents. Um, so that vulnerability to further exacerbated mental health challenges is really seen in that population group. Um, but that also provides an opportunity for intervention as well. So for example, in, in building resilience and coping skills in that population too. Regarding climate and ecological crisis, um, some other challenges specifically are to do with, um, we're seeing an increased frequency of extreme weather events um, that uh, can increase 
there are studies that show that this increase of mental health burden in those populations that are experiencing them. Um, and that also can lead to increased migration, uh, which particularly the community will know um, as can have quite severe impacts in terms of social networks, family bonds um, as well. And as Ashley already mentioned, the general exacerbation of inequality, so um, showing that uh, climate change is already and will continue to disproportionately affect more marginalized communities, including more marginalized children, youth and families. Um, and also um, the more complex changes to systems so, uh, for example, with more slow onset um, changes, such as rising sea levels, uh, for, for prolonged drought, the cascading impact on systems like food systems can also have uh, impacts on mental health and well-being as well. Um, and I guess lastly, to mention um, a term that has been maybe more familiar with, Eco anxiety um, and also uh, ecological grief. And those describe phenomena mostly relating to uh, an anticipatory anxiety of an extreme weather event happening or um, of a change to an environment. So, for example, with gradual biodiversity loss. And with young people specifically, in terms of thinking about the future, that is something that we are seeing and that's also documented in the literature um, as particularly affecting young people as well. Thank you so much for that, Viola, and you raise really important points, uh, especially something that I latched onto is just the, the inequality and how children and families are we know how they're affected by adverse weather events, by climate change. So thank you so much. And next, I would like to introduce a colleague who unfortunately is not able to be here with us today, Johnson Fanny Matinga, who is the Regional Psychosocial Support Initiative, also known as REPSI, Program Manager for the Zimbabwe Country Offices. And I'll be sharing a video that uh, Johnson sent us, and he sends his regards, of course. And I asked him, what are the promising practices you see in climate change and MHPSS programming? And just to note, there's a little background noise in the, in the video, but hopefully you will be able to hear. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Great. Good morning, good evening, colleagues. Thank you, Ashley, and the, the team for organizing this webinar. Um, as reps, we are grateful for the opportunity to contribute to this debate on climate change and mental health. Um, I want to address the issue around the promising practices that we are seeing um, for Zimbabwe. Promising practice starts with the country coming up with a, a national climate change response strategy. And that response strategy has um, facilitated different actors in country to respond to the issues around climate change. Now, as the Regional Psychosocial Support Initiative, we have also taken this opportunity to sensitize communities on the issue of climate change and its impact uh, on the mental health of children and families. Um, we, we do so by integrating the subject on mental health and climate change as a topical issue in all our programming. Uh, we take that opportunity to sensitize communities that uh, climate change is a reality. It is affecting children and families in, 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 in different ways. It 
indicates um, give a certain impact on the mental health of children and families. Therefore, we take every opportunity to take to integrate um, the, the, the subject of uh, mental health um, and climate change um, into our programming. We, we also see that we have been able to dispel myths around mental illness because when disaster strikes, um, communities tend to attribute these to supernatural causes instead of thinking them to the impact of climate change that is resulting in, uh, in, 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 in disasters in our environment. So we have made a start and the issue that different uh, actors in the North District North approach has been adopted uh, helps a um, uh, program to contribute uh, to alleviating the suffering of children and families as a result of uh, climate change in induced disasters. I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Johnson, for your video. And next, I would, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Povra, who is a medical doctor, writer, and a feminist activist strongly committed to meaningful youth participation. And she completed her medical training in India and has a master's in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we also have Julia, who is a young professional with a background in environmental policy and international relationships. It's also Julia's birthday. So happy birthday, Julia, and thanks for being with us today. And she's currently working as a project officer for the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, which is the world's largest alliance on women's, children's, and adolescents' health and well-being, which is hosted by the World Health Organization. So my first question is going to go to Povra. So from the perspective of a young person involved in climate policy and advocacy, what kind of dialogue around mental health and climate change are you observing in these spaces? And is there anything that you feel is missing from the discussion? Thanks so much, first and foremost, for having me and uh, also for the uh, uh, for the uh, question. And uh, to jump right into it, uh, from the perspective of somebody that's been working in climate policy and advocacy for the last few years, um, it's very uh, reassuring in more ways than one that mental health and climate change change um, as intersection is gaining more and more attention and also broadly climate change and health uh, is getting more attention than it used to um, over, over the last decade uh, and before that and uh, the current discussions uh, revolve uh, very prominently around um, the recognition of psychological and emotional impacts of climate change um, including, but uh, of course not limited to depression, uh, eco grief, eco anxiety, and uh, there's um, a very obvious increase in the recognition worldwide that addressing mental health is uh, very essential for effective climate action, and uh, a, a lot of young people are actually drivers of a lot of these conversations in their communities and also in global spaces. Um, and you see a lot of uh, young people, including uh, some on this uh, call, talk uh, and emphasize uh, the need for support systems, for mental health resources, um, community resilience building to cope with uh, the challenges, the mental health challenges that climate change poses. And uh, there's also a lot of conversation around creating safe spaces for dialogue and mutual support, self-care practices, and uh, most importantly, the destigmatization of mental health issues within climate movements and beyond. But um, now coming from a more critical lens uh, as to what's missing in some discussions um, entirely or in parts, First is when we talk about young people and children, um, 
there's a natural sentiment of uh, sort of boxing this group in one category and not fully recognize that this is not a homogeneous group. There are several intersectionalities that make um, different people within this group um, experience um, mental health impacts of climate change very differently. Um, and uh, it's just not emphasized the way it should be, because a lot of the funding that comes in for research, um, a lot of the interventions that uh, some that uh, certain groups and institutions have started designing are more broadly bracketed for several reasons, but there's, there is a tremendous need uh, to make this very clear that when you say young people, young people are in itself such a diverse cohort. So the one size fits all approach will fail miserably, especially when it comes to mental health. Um, another thing that's uh, emphasized in some ways and also not, uh, is also overlooked in, in other ways is how much difference cultural, social, and economic contexts make, especially in this intersection. Um, for example, uh, you, we cannot just talk about mental health without talking about psychosocial support, and we cannot talk about psychosocial support without talking about how uh, health inequities impact even access to the support. Um, and how cultural uh, how uh, cultural influences or how um, different social uh, factors and different social differences um, make it easier or more difficult to access uh, psychosocial support, even if financially, even in the hypothetical situation that financial um, issues do not exist. So um, bringing the health equity lens in this conversation is extremely important. Uh, growing uh, in the last few years, health equity has become a vertical of its own, which is nice in some ways, but which is also creating these issues in more ways, um, where we are talking about specific thematics, but not considering that these thematics also have a tremendous overlap with each other. And, um, and for the worry of uh, overshooting the time I'm allotted to answer, I'll just uh, bring up one other point, which is scientific data. Uh, there is scientific data around uh, how mental health, uh, psychosocial support and climate change inter interact and intersect with each other. But um, a lot of the advocacy that we see now is sort of delinked from this data. And a lot of the data we also have is not necessarily representative of different communities because an intervention that, for example, works in a, in a community in Latvia is not going to work the same way in India. And being able to justify the need for different interventions, the need for more funding is only possible when we have at least some initial work that's being done in different communities and that will only happen when we when we recognize and accept that these intersectionalities are extremely important in these discussions. Um, so I'm going to limit myself to that. And uh, thank you very much for the question again. Thank you so much, Dr. Povra. And you highlight something so important that we can, we have to think about diversity and not just create a one size fits all approach. And so thank you so much for highlighting that and, and everything else you said, and we'll come back to you. But a question for Julia is, are you aware of any initiatives that promote both mental health and climate resilience in which children and or youth are either leading or otherwise central to design and the implementation of the initiative? A very important question. And also, is there anything that sets these initiatives apart from others? Over to you, Julia. Thank you so much, Ashley, for um, this important question. And also thank you again for the invitation. It's lovely to share this very important space with you all today. Um, so I think um, starting building on from what Porva just mentioned, um, I agree that there is um, growing recognition of the um, threat of climate change on uh, children, adolescents and young people's well-being, including specifically uh, impacts on their mental health. Um, and um, although we see this growing recognition, the um, efforts really to create child and youth sensitive approaches and programs has been limited. 
And so often um, children, adolescents and young people are not really included in the design and implementation of climate initiatives, also when looking at the intersection between climate change and mental health. So, for example, I, I just want to start with some of the data for um, UNICEF's latest report in 2021 on the nationally determined contributions for um, climate change to the UN that only 12% of the NDCs mentioned the involvement of children in the planning processes of these NDCs. And when looking at young people, it was only 40%. If we analyze um, climate financing projects from the uh, multilateral climate funds, um, such as the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, et cetera, we find that only 1% of the projects involved children in the design and monitoring of the project. So overall, um, uh, we are not, the data shows that children and uh, young people are not really engaged in design and in the implementation of um, climate um, projects and um, uh, planning. Um, there are some good examples of climate projects that have been developed in collaboration with children and youth, um, and uh, which also address the consequences of climate change on um, mental health. And so I wanted to bring these two examples here today. Um, so the first one is the child-centered climate adaptation, uh, climate change adaptation program uh, supported by Plan International and uh, the Foundation for the Peoples of the South Pacific International. Um, it's a program that was implemented between 2011 and 2015 in six Pacific Island countries, and it really put uh, children at the center of climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. So um, the main focus of the project was really to um, build awareness and capacity building of children, uh, young people and their families to climate change. And so um, the program focused on assessing their existing knowledge and then co-developing with them uh, educational materials. And um, the program really saw children, young people and, the fa and their families working alongside local leaders to develop uh, locally designed smart solutions um, and uh, the establishment of uh, village disaster committees, uh, which were uh, really co-designed with um, children and young people themselves um, to build awareness of the community on what to do before, during and after a climate disaster. And so um, the outcome of the project was really that participants appreciated how they were able to um, really um, be prepared um, and um, uh, react towards uh, climate disasters. And this also helped in terms of reducing their anxiety and uh, feeling more prepared uh, for future um, climate extreme weather events. Um, the second example is also coming from uh, an island country, um, the Accelerator Lab in the Barbados, which was a project um, in collaboration with Uroport Barbados, which is a UNICEF initiative and the Ministry of Youth. And it was really um, to, uh, the project has been launched on World Mental Health Day uh, last year in 2022. And it really focused on uh, exploring the mental and emotional uh, connection that young people have with the environment and um, their um, thoughts when thinking about climate change and their future. Um, and the project really aimed to, aims to um, surface and support holistic solutions in order to understand what children and young people are feeling and uh, to design projects which can be um, uh, sort of targeted towards um, co-designed co with them, but to really enhance um, their um, awareness about climate change and how to be better prepared and um, looking specifically at how to reduce the mental health burdens of climate change. So overall, I think from um, these two examples, which I'm bringing here today, um, the broader evidence shows that really we are missing um, programs which are co-designed with children, adolescents, and young people. And it's really fundamental to scale up uh, adolescents and youth responsive climate policies and financing, uh, specifically at the intersection between climate change and mental health, which is one of the main priorities for young people around the world. Um, and this requires for sure capacity building and guidance on how to actually design an approach which is child and youth um, sensitive and how to co-design uh, these programs with uh, children and uh, young people. Um, it's also important to ensure that climate change considerations are always included in mental health programs and policies to ensure synergies and vice versa to integrate uh, mental health um, approaches also within um, when designing climate, uh, climate and health uh, policies to ensure that there's really synergies and we can leverage on um, these existing intersections. Thank you so much, Julie. I, I just want to say yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And the statistic that 
you spoke about only 1% of programming is inclusive or is co-designed with young people. That's a, a stark reminder that we as a community need to do a lot better. So thank you so much. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Povra. So the next question for you are, what are some lessons for mental health advocacy and promotion in the context of climate change that could be learned from other successful advocacy initiatives in the climate and health space? Over to you. Thanks again for that question. And uh, before I get straight to answering uh, the question as is, I think it's important to bring in two primary challenges that really set mental, mental health apart from the other health issues um, and their linkages with climate change. The first being a lot of these mental health issues and mental health challenges that climate change poses um, are more or less invisible. It's not like, uh, it's not like, for example, air pollution or cardiovascular disease, where you can see um, someone die of a stroke or where, where uh, a surgeon on their table can see blackened lungs, which makes it extremely challenging and adds so many layers of complexity to how uh, advocacy and promotion uh, for this particular linkage um, unfolds. And the second challenge uh, really is, how do we prioritize something that we don't see? Within the health community and people who are more health literate in, in some ways, uh, it's, it's still understandable that mental health and climate change is an important linkage. But when we go down to people who are actually making policies, making decisions, um, and doing uh, a lot of the work nationally or subnationally, we're talking about politicians who uh, in in some ways uh, and in some extreme situations uh, completely disregard uh, the existence of mental health issues. Um, so let, us, let alone its linkage with climate change. And the, the same holds true for climate change. There are so many politicians across the world that uh, disregard climate change as an issue. So this interlink linkage becomes quite challenging. And just uh, to drive that a bit further, so I'm based in India, and uh, when you talk about mental health, a lot of times you're looked at as an elitist in more ways than one, because we're talking about the same country where not long, long ago there were news reports of people eating rats um, for the lack of other food uh, out of extreme hunger. So when you talk about mental health in a context like that, your advocacy and promotion has to be very different than it would otherwise be for other health issues uh, because you don't see a lot of this really. Um, so uh, now coming to, to the, the body of the question you asked, uh, what are the lessons we learn? Um, while these challenges and differences exist, there are still a lot of things that we can learn from other initiatives within the climate change and health space. First and foremost, and in my view, the most important one being uh, collaboration coalition building. It's easy to ignore a small group of people. It's extremely difficult to ignore the same group when it's thousands of people saying the same thing. Um, and repetition actually works. And for people uh, who are into psychiatry and psychology, um, you will know that it works so much. It can change. It can change certain structures in your brain if done over very long periods. And successful initiatives, for example, uh, one would be the mobilization around clean air, um, its link with, linkage with climate change and health pollution, um, and sorry, and uh, and human health. Uh, the way that mobilization was done, uh, how many diverse stakeholders, including activists, researchers, health professionals, policymakers, and most importantly, people from affected communities came, uh, came together um, in, in multiple collaborations and, and coalitions to take this forward. And uh, we can see the same in some ways happen within the climate change and mental health space as well, but we have a long way to go. And we need to keep reminding ourselves of that lesson and how we, we need to bring it back and really apply it in our work. Um, it's great to be doing work in, in a small group, but it's better when we're not replicating each other's efforts. Um, and one other message that comes very strongly and one other lesson rather that, that 
uh, is uh, that in some ways embodies even the core of my being is um, evidence-based messaging and storytelling. Uh, you can throw a million numbers at people, um, but you will. I don't think there's any debate that it's a lot more impactful when it comes to the story, when there's a face behind behind numbers like those. So as a community, what we need to start asking ourselves is how do we channel these different voices? Because a number becomes a lot more relatable when there's a face with it. And when there's a face of someone that comes from the same community as yours, it's undeniably real. Um, so effective advocacy initiatives, which uh, sort of combine scientific evidence with, with compelling narratives uh, to convey how urgent uh, this dimension of human health and its inter intersection with climate change is um, is very, very uh, important in my view. And uh, just to leave you with an example on that would be climate change and migrants' health. Um, a lot of this advocacy really got a push when migrants from different communities started to speak about their stories, come forward with it. Um, and uh, I, at the same time, also understand it's a bit more challenging when you talk about mental health because of the stigma of accepting that you have a mental health issue. But uh, as someone who has spoken about uh, my own story and my own journey with mental health in the past, um, I can surely look back and say that's one of the most powerful ways of moving people, of moving communities, because even if one person starts to share the story, it gives a lot of power to a lot more listening to that story to be able to share this. Um, so, uh, yeah, one important lesson is to add these stories and um, and these narrations to a lot of the data we are, we are producing already and utilizing these lived experiences, um, relatable examples to engage and mobilize a much wider audience. And just the last point, um, would be to ask ourselves, whose voice are we bringing forward? Um, as, a, as a practicing doctor, I know when I stand in my scrubs and say, say that climate change is a health threat, it makes a lot more difference. When an adolescent speaks on how, they, uh, how their health is affected um, versus a 40 year old speaking on adolescent health definitely changes the optics a lot and definitely changes how the message is received. And I think it's it's high time that we within the climate change and mental health space and communities start recognizing and really um, adopting that in our work. But um, there are definitely more lessons, but these are the ones that I'm going to leave you with for now. Um, and thanks again for letting me share those. Thank you so much, Dr. Povra, and thank you for that insight and really, really uh, valuable points. And I, I very much picked up on this aspect of storytelling and voices and collaboration and coalitions and coming together as, as a united voice and being stronger. So thank you so much for all that insight. I will now pass back to you, Julia. So from your perspective, how are young people promoting mental health and climate justice in their own advocacy? And what opportunities do young people have to join this, these advocacy efforts? Um, thanks so much, Ashley. And um, I want to build on what has already been said on the fact that um, really for um, children, adolescents, and young people, mental health um, is really emerging as one of the greatest consequences of climate of climate change and the climate crisis and um, the issue of intergenerational injustice. So um, we know we all know that climate change will disproportionately uh, be affect be affecting. Um, uh, newborns, children, young people, and future generations, even though um, young people and future generations are the ones who have least um, contributed to climate change. And so um, this is really pushing young people around the world to um, take action. And um, we know the evidence shows that psychological distress caused by climate change uh, is often uh, leading uh, to um, leading young people to actually engage in climate action and uh, climate action is uh, sometimes an antidote to climate related anxiety and poor well being so around the world. Um, I think we hear it now a lot in the news, uh, both at the global level, but also at the national level young people have really been driving 
uh, human rights approach to climate change, really trying to uh, focus on the issue of climate justice um, and uh, the disproportional impacts that climate change has on vulnerable populations. So um, based on uh, gender, age, um, and um, yeah, other geographical diversity, et cetera. And so um, really young people have been uh, joining this advocacy movement. And we see this both in terms of their engagement in protests in the streets, their engagement in terms of um, joining climate litigation movements and really holding their governments accountable for um, lack of climate action and continuing to um, have high greenhouse gas emissions and not um, adhering to the commitments that they've made to the Paris Agreement. We see this also in terms of um, the uh, advocacy that they have in terms of uh, that they're uh, pushing out in terms of um, at the UNFCCC conferences, the uh, uh, conferences of the parties every year, but also at the national level. So in their uh, local communities, local parliaments. Um, and um, one of the opportunities I think that I wanted to bring to this space today uh, is um, the 1.8 Young People for Change campaign. Um, so we know that nowadays around the world, there's 1.8 billion um, adolescents and young people around the world. And um, young people have been issuing this global youth-led campaign to really mobilize for uh, better action for adolescent well-being, including issues such as mental health, uh, climate change, road safety injuries, sexual reproductive health and rights. Uh, in the context of growing um, conflicts, um, increasing uh, impacts of the climate crisis and the COVID-19 recovery. Um, and it's really a campaign which aims to um, call for governments for increased policies, financing and services really targeted to adolescents and young people. Um, this campaign um, will be the beginning of a countdown to the Global Forum for Adolescents, which will be held in October on the 11th and 12th of October. Um, and uh, the um, forum will be dedicated towards achieving the SDGs through a laser-like focus on this population group which has been uh, historically uh, not um, addressed in terms of the 20, 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And um, so the forum will really serve as a platform to bring together um, a diverse group of stakeholders to call for political and financial attention to adolescents and young people, including in relation to issues such as mental health and climate change. And there are different ways to get involved, uh, both as young people, but also as uh, practitioners in this space. Um, and there's opportunity in terms of joining the campaign, the 1.8 campaign, uh, and really um, leveraging the power of uh, partnership in terms of asking and demanding for change uh, for um, adolescents and young people, which are um, really most impacted by these issues. Um, some ways to get involved, and then I can also put the link in the chat, I see that some people are asking, um, is um, the forum will be, there will be a two, two day uh, virtual main stage at the global level, but really um, the focus of the forum will be at the national level in these national programs, national global forums. And the idea is that partners on the ground will really uh, uh, come together in a partnership fashion, because as Purva said, when we are together and we cooperate together, that is where most of the change happens. Happens, and really um, to um, bring attention at the national level to, to the needs of adolescents and young people in the country. So, for example, what are the biggest mental health issues of adolescents and young people in a specific country? What, are, what is this driven by? And, uh, for example, what is the impact of climate change specifically on adolescents and young people in that country? and really to call for uh, the government uh, and other stakeholders to really commit to having uh, more financing policies and services for adolescents and young people. Um, for this campaign, we have launched um, a chatbot, the uh, What Young People Want initiative, which is built on the uh, What Women Want initiative, uh, which was set up a couple of years ago. And the idea is really to um, gather inputs from young people themselves in terms of what do they want for their well-being. And actually, issues such as mental health, issues such as climate change are really emerging as uh, one of the main priorities. So. Um, that is another way to be engaged, and um, I'll put the link in the chat where you can find more information, but really joining this movement towards um, asking for commitments for um, these populations, which uh, adolescents and young people, which are 
uh, being affected by these poly crises and these multiple crises that we have around the world is very important. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this is one of the main ways uh, in which um, everyone could get involved and I'm happy to provide more information also in the chat or through follow up questions. Um, thank you, Ashley, back to you. Thank you so much, Julia. And it's incredible to hear about the 1.8 billion initiative. Thank you so much for sharing that important advocacy opportunity with all of us. And I'm just so incredibly impressed by, by you and, and all the panelists here today. It's incredible to see your passion and your drive and it really comes through in this conversation. I don't think I've ever been so uh, in, enthralled with a webinar. So thank you so much. And we have a lot of really great questions from our guests here today. And I'll start off with one for Dr. Povra. And of course, uh, anyone can jump in, Viola, Julia, or Dr. Povra to answer these. But picking up on your comment about the need to have contextualized responses, what are your thoughts on how do we design interventions that respond to the specific context and diverse groups of young people in, in any given context? So thinking about crisis settings or non-crisis settings, and are there any principles or guidelines or tools that might help us as a community to do that? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, I was hoping somebody somebody would ask. Um, and also thanks to Julia because she partially answered uh, that question before it was even asked in some ways. Um, and if I had to just summarize this in one sentence, uh, my response would be um, the people who live within certain contexts are the best people to tell you about them. So if we want to uh, design interventions that respond to these specific contexts uh, and these diverse groups of young people in, in a given context, it's necessary to have young people from these contexts speak for themselves and speak to their experiences. Um, for example, if even within your organization, you, you're developing um, some sort of a toolkit for young people, and if, um, it's if you have only two young people looking at it uh, from very similar contexts, you're going to have very limited input and uh, you definitely risk not having different contexts represented because there are not enough people from those contexts speaking up. Um, and in, in intervention design, what we tend to do is we tend to recognize problems that are brought to us and uh, very um, in in some ways having a blindfold on what we don't see in that laundry list prevents us from understanding these different contexts. So my simple answer to that would be it is only possible when your guiding principle or the core of what you're doing really brings people together from these different contexts. And um, I know that the arguments for something like this is that it's very resource intensive etc. But post COVID, um, we've seen the power of um, being able to reach people online and in communities where you can't reach people online, there's so many groups already working with these communities. So half your work is usually done, if you're able to be smart about finding these, these different groups and these different voices. Um, but an intervention remains incomplete without um, including the people that are, are supposed to benefit from these interventions in every step of the process, which includes the design, which includes the implementation, which includes monitoring and evaluation of that of these interventions. And uh, just quickly touching also on guidance and tools that might help. Um, there is an unending list of tools uh, that speak about meaningful youth engagement. And uh, in, in the next few minutes, I'm happy to drop a few of these links in the chat as well for you to uh, go through. But um, there are quite a few guidances now uh, coming in from UN agencies, from youth, group themse youth groups themselves, 
on um, how young people would like to be involved in, in the making of these different interventions. And I also encourage, I can see that there are quite a few young people also in the participants. So I would also encourage uh, you to take this space and share resources from, from your networks or, or from your work in the chat uh, as a response to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that answer. And we would love any resources that you can share with us. Um, the next question is from Lynette, and this can be for anyone. But what is the role of resilience in preventing further climate change, climate disasters? And how do we interact with the environment and or adapt to a world that is changing so rapidly? How do we bring relationship with the environment into our understanding of well-being? So that's quite a few questions in one. Anyone can take that. Um, I'm happy to maybe start off and then Viola, Porva, and anyone else, please feel free to come in. Um, I think um, the issue of community uh, resilience is very, very important and crucial when we talk about um, children, adolescents, and young people's well-being. And um, I just wanted to share, so um, uh, at PMNCH, we've been working on a framework for adolescent well-being, and Viola has also been very, Viola and Porva actually have both been, been very much engaged. And so when we talk about adolescent well-being, um, the framework looks at five domains, um, good health and optimum nutrition, safe and supportive environment, uh, education, employment, uh, and job opportunities, agency, and resilience. And so the issue of um, really safe and supportive environment, and sorry, and the, I, uh, the fifth one, connecting this to connecting this to, to society, um, and so the both in, uh, in uh, the community really plays a role in terms of all of these uh, five domains, and specifically when we look at connecting this to, to society and uh, safe and supportive environment, this really. Um, looks at the importance that the communities, families, and um, the um, uh, local environment really has in terms of contributing to adolescent well-being. And so, for example, when young people uh, feel the um, um, feel engaged and feel empowered to actually engage in their local community and have the agency to be engaged, um, um, this really influences and improves their own well-being because they feel that they can actually contribute to their society. So when looking specifically at climate change, um, it, it is similar in the sense that uh, the burden cannot only be borne by children, adolescents, and young people, but young people by themselves, but it's really, I mean, climate change affects the whole of the community, and it's really the responsibility of the whole of the community in terms of building the resilience to climate change. And this should not be borne necessarily only by children, adolescents, and young people who, as I mentioned before, have contributed least to the problem. So um, the, the, the idea to adopt really a community-based uh, approach and having young people actually engaged in terms of decision makers and co-designers of these programs within the community is very important. Um, so yeah, just wanted to, to add this and Viola Purva, please come in if you have any additional thoughts on this question. Wonderful, I will go to the next question. So given that countries in the global north contribute to the majority of climate emissions, what is community engagement and ownership of climate change programming look like in the global south? I wonder how communities in the global south frame climate change impacts and how does the international community guard against pushing its own agenda against these communities? Very wonderful question. Anyone can jump in and take it. Um, Viola, do you want to go ahead or should I? No, I was just waiting precisely because I think with COP and those uh, efforts, there, there's all of that dialogue around loss and damage that I think you can speak to. Yeah. Questions. 
So I think, um, and yeah, please others do come in, but in terms of um, how communities in the global South frame climate change impacts, um, as Yola was mentioning, there is this um, um, discussion of loss and damage, which has been brought to the um, COP, UNFCCC COP's attention, and specifically at the last COP in COP27, um, finally, it was agreed on a framework for loss and damage and specifically the establishment of a loss and damage fund. So um, in the global, the issue of loss and damage is essentially having um, a recognition that the impacts of climate change are being disproportionately borne by the global south. And what this means is that it's causing global south countries to actually lose or have um, damage on uh because of the impacts of climate change and specifically when we look at for example small island states right um, they're actually losing their territory and it risking losing their nation because of the sea levels rise and so um, they are demanding rightly so uh, compensation for um, the damage that is being caused so this is an issue that is primarily brought at the these international negotiations for uh, by global south countries um, and it has been historically sort of there's been a pushback by global north countries on this uh, um, and um, finally, at COP27, they actually started to, uh, it was one of the main agenda items, and um, they started the negotiations and agreed on the establishment of a loss and damage fund. Um, and the important thing also in this, uh, when establishing this loss and damage fund will be that the actual money is then geared towards and prioritizes those most in need. So those within the within the global South countries, those who are actually most affected by climate change, because as Porva said, not everyone within the same society, not everyone is actually impacted in the same way. So for example, as we're saying now, like children, young people are disproportionately affected. Uh, people from more sort of low income groups are more disproportionately be affected. Women are more affected. Uh, and so this is something else that will need to sort of uh, be fleshed out um, in terms of when looking at these issues. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, please do add on anything um, else. I think there's there's a lot more to to bring to this discussion as well. Thank you so much, Julia. And I'll ask one follow up question, unless uh, Dr. Pover and Viola, if you want to jump in on that last one. Um, I can go after the follow up. Perfect. So. The next question is, and unfortunately, this is our last one, but is there any innovation regarding preparedness or anticipatory action on MHPSS and climate change? Uh, yes, yeah, so I can go for that one, <laughs> because actually at the Collaborative, uh, we've been conducting a preliminary mapping of um, whether there are any MHPSS and climate change programs. Um, and that's proven to be quite difficult, um, specifically to do with the integration. So I saw previously there was a question around synergies, and I guess I just wanted to add a little bit more there um, in terms of when we talk about MHPSS and climate change synergies. Um, I think Julia also mentioned it previously kind of asking the question of what elements of MHPSS programming could benefit or even increase um, the, the impact and also uh, the outcome of climate adaptation program um, or disaster, <clears throat> sorry, disaster risk reduction effort. Um, and what element of sustainability, climate adaptation, um, environmental education, justice can also benefit um, mental health outcomes and well-being outcomes. So having that kind of dual um, influence of both. Um, and the challenge that we're seeing is that actually in terms of um, from the kind of research community perspective for when there is a lack of data to be able to really make those quite clear um, suggestions of these are the gold standards of how to integrate um, but then also from the programmatic perspective, in terms of, I think Perva also mentioned the monitoring and evaluation plans, theories of change that also consider these more kind of system based and kind of dual and potentially even further influences between 
um, programs. That's something that we're missing and that could really help in making that case for innovation um, also from the advocacy perspective. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that question by saying these are the best things that you should do, but more with a suggestion of if you're working in an organization and you have an MHPSS program or you're involved in a climate um, adaptation program, is there a way to integrate um, questions around um, collecting data on, for example, mental health outcomes um, as well? So, Thank you so much for that, Viola. And do we have any final thoughts from our panelists before I hand over to MHPSS.net? Is it uh, okay if I just do a, a short response to actually both the, the last question and the one before that? Um, but just talking about MHPSS in, in the context of climate change and innovative approaches um, surrounding it, um, I think, uh, again, I, I'm not the, the best expert uh, in this and uh, piggybacking on what Viola said. Um, one example that comes to mind immediately a, from my local community, again, is the integration of MHPSS um, and the efforts in integrating this into early warning systems and uh, disaster preparedness strategies, um, where, which also goes to say that there's an increased understanding uh, that psychological and mental health impacts of climate change, especially of uh, disasters, uh, are incomplete. Um, and all of these strategies are incomplete without incorporating MHPSS into them. And uh, again, uh, because I, I cannot complete a statement without emphasizing on the uh, vulnerabilities and intersectionalities, also addressing these before, during, and after climate-related disasters. But in terms of innovation, um, exactly, there are examples and reports of initiatives trying to leverage um, digital health technologies and, and mobile uh, applications to provide these resources and services to support individuals in different areas. Um, but again, this comes with an understanding that this is possible where there is access to these technologies um, and the conversation around equities and injustice um, from a resource point of view very much applies. But uh, a good example of this would be uh, trying to reach um, vulnerable communities and affected communities in Sudan, where a bunch of um, medical doctors and medical students from across the world uh, came together to try and deliver uh, these uh, interventions remotely, which would, which would otherwise be impossible to do physically um, going and talking to communities in Sudan. So there are some examples, um, and I, I just tried to share one that came to mind immediately. And just dialing back uh, to the previous question, on um, the global uh, south and uh, the global north perspective and uh, how how the global south is more affected um, and the international community uh, and the international community's response to uh, this whole situation. Um, I think what's important to understand and also again, uh, taking, taking from what Julia said on um, the impacts that the global south faces are extremely disproportionate and a lot of the drivers of climate change um, actually sit in the global north but the impacts are, are faced more indiscriminately by those in the global south um, but uh, while this movement is shaping up quite rapidly um, what's been promising to see uh, is that uh, the unique experiences that are coming out and community. Um, the only way we can balance out as, as uh, groups from Global South, the pressure that Global North groups exist um, and uh, enforce in international spaces is bringing our unique experiences, um, for example, agricultural disruptions, uh, water scarcity, and increased vulnerability to extreme weather events um, to the table. And um, again, I am a firm believer of um, 
power and strength of coming together, which we see now by Global South, where countries in the Global South are coming together and asking for reparations um, and building really strong uh, advocacy initiatives coming together within governmental spaces and outside. Um, so while it, it is a very legitimate concern on how the global north is responding to it and, and may and how this response may change in the future, there is also hope uh, there. And what we as a civil society or from uh, from agencies uh, working with civil societies can do is bring together grassroots organization and build their capacities in actually being able to understand the intricacies of of um, um, of this global south, um, um, of the impact that global south is facing differently than the global north, because a lot of communities still don't understand this as much as um, they should, and providing resources for more community-driven solutions um, with uh, to build programs that actually align with the needs and aspirations of um, us living in the global south. Um, we can only... Uh, the only solution, the only realistic solution is to push ourselves um, into these spaces as much as possible. And even as young people, that's already being done. So there, I'll just leave with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Povra, Viola, and Julia. It was such a pleasure speaking with you here today. I, I think we could speak for hours. And as I said earlier, your, your passion and your commitment and your expertise really comes through. This has been an incredible webinar. Thank you to all of our participants. And I know that many, many more people are going to be watching this online. So I will hand over to mhpss.net to finish us up. Thank you, Ashley. I just want to thank um, all the speakers today for this interesting webinar. And also to all of you for joining us today. We're going to be sharing now a poll um, for you to please reply. There's a poll um, on the webinar. We'd like to know um, your opinion about it. So please um, complete it. We'll also be sharing the links to our COP space and also our resource collection. Thank you.